Good evening and welcome to Have a Seat with Chris Hansen. I'm Chris Hansen tonight from Los Angeles as we continue our coverage of the Peter Nygaard investigation. You followed this, I'm sure, here on the YouTube channel, but also on Discovery Plus, the series I was involved with putting together, the fashion mogul, multi-multi-millionaire, uh, Canadian, Finnish, uh, had outposts in the Bahamas, in Los Angeles, in New York City, now accused of sexual misconduct and human trafficking involving dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of women as young as 13, 14 years old. Some of this taking place in the Bahamas, some in Los Angeles, some in Canada and around the world. There have been some developments in this story. And one of the things that always interests me here is that these predators, Epstein, Nygaard, Weinstein, et cetera, never are able to accomplish these deeds alone. They have enablers. So tonight, we're going to talk to Lisa Haba, who is a lawyer from the Haba Law Firm in Orlando, Florida, who represents some of the victims in a civil class action lawsuit against Peter Nygaard. And we'll also talk to Pekka Mike Cannon, who's a reporter for Helsinki Sanomat, which is a major newspaper in Finland, where this has also been a big story. And he's been covering this and has some insight into one of the enablers. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. First of all, I'd like to introduce Lisa Haba. Good evening, Lisa. Thanks for being on the show. How are you? I'm great, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. As we've covered this story, the enablers stick out to me as one of the next major elements here. One in particular uh, named now in legal action, Danny Fitzgerald. Set up Danny Fitzgerald for me. He's a Los Angeles real estate guy, friend of Peter Nygaard, uh, has a significant social media presence under Danny Hollywood Homes. Explain to me who Danny Fitzgerald is in your world. Sure. So as we began our investigation into Peter Nygaard, there has been an extensive amount of information given to us about some of Peter Nygaard's friends, colleagues, and co-conspirators. And one of the most prolific names that keeps coming up over and over again has been Danny Fitzgerald. Danny Fitzgerald is one of Peter Nygaard's best friends. He's an individual that we have heard accounts from over and over again, has a booming business in real estate in the LA area in California. He owns a business called Danny Hollywood Homes, has a huge uh, presence on social media. And Danny is one of the individuals that used to bring a number of women to Peter Nygaard for recruitment. And what would happen is when Peter Nygaard had his dinner parties and pamper parties, Danny would bring, bring a girl over and ultimately would oftentimes exchange that girl for sexual favors with Peter Nygaard. So this in itself, Lisa, you would argue was a form of human trafficking. And, and when we talk about these allegations, in case people are just tuning in and following the Peter Nygaard story for the first time, we're talking about potentially thousands of victims spanning five decades and and victims who were forced into sex, drugged, uh, manipulated, uh, some pretty aggressive behavior, criminal behavior on the part of Nygaard. And now you're saying that Danny Fitzgerald has some responsibility here too. Absolutely. He treated people like commodities. He treated human beings like they were a thing to be, to be purchased, bought and sold. And so when he would come to Peter Nygaard, you know, the commodity that Peter Nygaard worked in, that Danny Fitzgerald worked in, was sex. And so they would trade a human being for sex and sexual profit to themselves. So Peter Nygaard would have a girl, Danny Fitzgerald would have a girl, and they would essentially use the person that they, quote unquote, were in control of and would swap them for sexual favors. This was not to the girl's choice. This was not their preference necessarily. But in the case of Danny Fitzgerald and for the victims that we have filed a lawsuit on behalf of, this is absolutely, absolutely against their will. It was not part of anything they wanted. Danny Fitzgerald, as we mentioned earlier, has a, a sizable social media presence and has put videos up in, in different social media platforms bragging about this sort of thing. And you could write it off as, you know, playboy, boorish behavior. But in the harsh light of this investigation, it takes on a different meeting. Let's take a look at one of those videos that you talk about in the lawsuit. Peter, look what I flew in just for our birthday, Peter. I figured 
I get us a present <laughs> flown all the way from Vegas and San Jose, a ballerina. And Angelina <laughs> Katrina Medina. Come on in to our limo. Peter gonna be so happy. And there's our photographer and the decoration planner. <laughs> Lisa, in that video, Danny Fitzgerald comes right out and says, these are two women I had imported, essentially, one for me and one for Peter Nygaard. What do you make of that? Well, that's exactly what the two of them were doing. They treated people like they were objects. And this video is just one of several things that they put out there very publicly. Danny Fitzgerald did not hide what he was doing. But this is just further evidence to show and support the allegations that we have brought forth that many women were victims of Danny Fitzgerald, both as part of the sex trafficking venture that Peter Nygaard was running and Danny Fitzgerald enabled, as well as the harm that Danny Fitzgerald put upon women as individuals as well. What separates this from playboy behavior, womanizing and potentially criminal behavior, Lisa? Well, there is a big difference. And that really comes down to if you are committing the act of human trafficking, then what that essentially means is that you are treating a human being as though they're a piece of property. And so if you're taking a human being and you are bringing them to another person, if you are having them engage in commercial sexual activity and commercial sexual activity, let me be clear, doesn't necessarily mean prostitution. That's kind of a, a misnomer that people think it's always prostitution. Commercial sexual activity means that any person receives a, something of value in exchange for the sexual activity. So if we have commercial sex and Danny Fitzgerald's receiving sexual activity from basically bringing a person to Peter Nygaard, Peter Nygaard says, here, you can have a girl back in exchange. Here's your payment, so to speak, for bringing me a victim to either rape or have sex with against her will. Then you're now in a situation where Danny Fitzgerald has engaged in commercial sexual, sexual activity he has brought another human being and exploited that person for a, a profit, quote unquote, being that, that commercial sex that he received. And in exchange, now he has benefited from that. So if you look into the definition of human trafficking, we are now dealing in a different world than just somebody who goes out there and has maybe casual sex because he has a lot of money, which would be the, more the playboy atmosphere that you're speaking of. Danny Fitzgerald was... Uh involved in these so-called pamper parties that Peter Nygaard would throw, especially the ones in Marina Del Rey near Los Angeles. What did he get out of this? What was his role in putting those pamper parties together? And, and, and were these parties just a mechanism for human trafficking at the end of the day? They were, Chris. And I know last time I was on your show, we talked a lot about the pamper parties. And I want to remind you know those that are tuning in again or just tuning in now, that these pamper parties were more than just a party. They were put on a front showing that this was a party that was supposed to be for fun, to promote the company, but in reality, it was a recruiting ground for Peter Nygaard's victims. And he would look at who attended, select his victim or victims for the night, and those people would be having sexual relations with Peter Nygaard, whether they wanted to be or not. Now, at these pamper parties, Danny Fitzgerald was a huge part of putting them on in the LA area. At Peter Nygaard's Marina Del Rey property, Danny promoted these tremendously. They were all over his social media account, his business social media account, Danny Hollywood Homes. He had tremendous pull in different fields of celebrities, of famous YouTubers, you name it. And those people all were invited to the pamper parties. With that kind of pull, you can only imagine how many victims and innocent parties came thinking they were going to one thing and in fact ended up at another. We should say that Danny Fitzgerald, although named in this civil uh, action, has not been charged criminally in relation to the Nygaard uh, accusations. We did try to reach him, but were unable to get comment on this story. Nygaard, uh, as we speak, is locked up in Winnipeg in Canada. Uh, 
pending extradition to the United States to face criminal charges on indictments that came out of uh, New York City. Um, we also have with us, as I mentioned earlier, Pekka Mykanen, who's a reporter in Finland. Uh, Pekka, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Hi. I appreciate it. And you bring to this an additional international angle here. We know, and Lisa and I have discussed this, as well as uh, you know, some of the other people involved in this investigation, that this involves activity in the Bahamas, in Canada, in the United States. You have spent a great deal of time investigating and, and turning over information having to do with Peter Nygaard's longtime PR director, a woman named Tina Tula Corpi, who has been sort of the, the person in charge of preserving his image over the years, protecting him and perhaps even now helping to protect finances as he faces these criminal charges and all this uh, civil legal action. Give me a sense as to who Tina Tula Corpi is and what role she may have played in this entire investigation, this case. Well, Tina Tulikorp is a 54-year-old woman who uh, is still a Finnish national. Uh, she came to the Nygaard circles around 1987, 1988, as a people who I interviewed. And so uh, he became extremely close to Peter Nygaard. And, um, and her role really was... Um, uh, her title was to be a PR and marketing director of, of the Nygaard International, but her real job, as far as I can understand, is to put out the fires whenever Peter Nygaard was in trouble, if it was a PR trouble or a legal trouble, uh, she would be involved in one way or the other. So basically cleaning up uh, the mess, clearing his name, and making sure that the word about anything that would have happened um, would not get out. So we have different kinds of enablers, as, as we heard from Lisa's introduction already. Uh, people, some in a very high up, and then some people very hands-on with the actual sex crimes. Do you think that Peter Nygaard could have gotten away with these acts, these alleged acts, for so many years without somebody like Tina Tillicorpi? Well, I understand Lisa and Greg have um, already more than 120 women who are accusing him of rape. The earliest cases are from 1970s, 50 years. Um, as far as I can tell and what I understand from what I've read and, and studied myself is that there have been dozens and dozens of people involved in, in covering up things. Some of them have been very hands-on, hush money to the victim, stay quiet, don't say a word, or you will get in trouble. And some other people have tried to quiet down those people who heard about something and then would make it public or go to the police. And then uh, Nygaard's legal team would get involved and people like Dina Tulikorpi would get involved. What was the most surprising, perhaps shocking thing that you uncovered in your reporting over there in Finland, Becca? Um, the, the shocking part in a way is sometimes the most mundane part is that you have somebody who's in a air conditioned, uh, corporate office, uh, with a coffee machine and is taking phone calls and making phone calls and making things like this disappear. Uh, it's, it's very mundane work when you think about it. It's, it's, it's like a corporate job. My job is to, to to make sure that no one knows there is a guy like that out there. Um, obviously, uh, Tina Tulikorpi is not, um, as far as I can tell, she's not accused of any crime. Uh, she's innocent, uh, obviously before law, but there are many, many question marks about how can you be next to someone for 33 years? And she was extremely close to him. I mean, um, if you go to YouTube and watch the last video posted on Nygaard Fashions, it's, it's very puzzling. It's actually a video of Nygaard's sister's funeral. And you watch that video and you have Nygaard and Tino Tulikorpi walking uh, one after another to say their last goodbyes to 
to the sister, Lisa Nagar Johnson, and they're standing by the casket together. They're standing by the grave together. Their speeches are cut uh, back to back to one another on, on the video. So she was as close as it gets. When you think about a clothing empire with 1,600 employees, what do you have to do to get to the boss's sister's funeral? It's, it's mind boggling. It is uh, bizarre to watch that video in, in, from a couple of different angles. Normally people, at least in, in my experience, don't post funeral videos very often to, to uh, YouTube or any other social media platform, yet they did here. And it was almost like they were sending some sort of a message. Uh, did you read anything more into that, Pekka, seeing that, knowing what you know about this story? Um, it's interesting. The video was posted about two weeks before uh, Lisa and, and Greg filed the first version of the uh, Jane Doe uh, class action suit with, with the first 10, 10 survivors accusing him of rape. Uh, those were the normal days. That's what a normal day would look like in the Nygaard family. It's, it's public life. It's something you would proudly put out there. Um, and another um, kind of shocking aspect to the Nygaard story is that he was a public figure. He was a well-known figure. He was someone who had George H.W. Bush visiting his Bahamas homes. I'm not implicating him in any way, but, but what I'm saying is he's a, he's a well-known figure. So uh, it's just quite incredible that uh, the story did not come out before February of 2020 when, when or in, in this massive way that... Uh, it came out when when uh, the class action suit was or the complaint was filed. Well, that brings up a number of interesting points, Lisa, and I want to run some of this by you. Uh, first of all, Pekka talks about Greg. That's Greg Gutzler, who is also a lawyer on this case involved in the uh, the civil litigation uh, focusing on Nygaard and his behavior and representing the victims in this case. But you talk about visitors and high profile people, uh, step aside from the enablers for a minute, but you did have a lot of celebrities, a lot of politically influential people who did visit uh, the Nygaard estate in, um, in the Bahamas over the years. Many of these people just wanted to go see it out of curiosity or were invited. Oprah Winfrey talked about it in a show. Uh, it was Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, but a lot of these people probably had no idea the uh, atrocious, illegal, criminal activity that, that was taking place there. I would say that that's probably true. We have had no indication that there's been any major celebrity that's been involved in any capacity in this criminal enterprise run by Peter Nygaard. The closest thing to a celebrity, and I don't even want to call him a celebrity, is going to be Danny Fitzgerald, who certainly is not famous, but is rather infamous at this point for being the co-conspirator to Peter Nygaard in, in the Marina Del Rey portion of this. But I certainly would not go as far as to call him a celebrity. Uh, but there have been, like, as you said, Chris, tremendous number of celebrities. But I think part of why that's important to understand that that was happening, even though they weren't a part of this, is because when a person has the appearance of having wealth and power, and Peter Nygaard had plenty of wealth and plenty of power, but it, it really magnetized it and made it seem tremendously bigger than it was even to say that he knew all these celebrities and all these politicians and all these famous people across the world because when a victim was hurt and they were silenced and they were told nobody's going to leave you, it gave that much more fear and magnitude to what they were saying because they realized who am I to go up against this, this mountain of a man. And so that's why it's so important now to look at what this is, and every single one of those voices not only matters, but they're being heard. And this quote unquote mountain has finally been toppled and he's finally being held accountable for the unspeakable crimes he's been accused of committing. Nygaard is now 79, uh, facing charges that could essentially be a life sentence. He's not even up for an extradition hearing in Winnipeg until November. Uh, at which point, if the court allows, he'd be transferred to the United States to face the, the very, very serious charges stemming from the indictment in the Southern District of New York. Um, you'd think he's gotten away with this for a long time. How important, Lisa, was somebody like Tina Tulacorpi in helping him to get away with these 
alleged activities for so many years. I think Pekka said it perfectly. You know, there's people at every level in these enterprises. There's somebody at the ground level and people at the top level. And Tina was right there at the top. From all the evidence we have seen from the allegations we've raised in our complaint against Peter Nygaard, we named Tina Tulacorpi as a co-conspirator in our complaint. And part of that is because she did exactly what Pekka said. She was helping do the cover-ups. She was helping silence victims. When people will call in with an HR complaint, it didn't end up on the books or it disappeared. There was a lot of cover-up and cleanup that was being done across the world. And our understanding and our evidence and investigation as part of our lawsuit has led to believe that Tina Cuchula Corpi was at the heart of that cover-up. Pekka, what about the financial aspect of this? Do you believe or has your reporting shown anything about the, the money trail and Tina Tulkorpi's alleged involvement in that or any other corporations or being able to protect this vast wealth that uh, Peter Nygaard has uh, been able to generate over the years? Well, I think an uh, interesting point to make here is uh, Lisa would know a lot about this because uh, they, they filed another a separate uh, civil suit where uh, the, the uh, famous actress April Telek is going uh, against uh, Angela Dyborn, who is a niece of uh, Peter Nygaard. Um, and um, in, in that separate case, in, in, and April Telek is accusing him of rape and her aiding her in that case. And so in that, in, in that separate suit, um, uh, the lawyers are saying that uh, Dina Tuli Corpi uh, Angela Dyborn and another person called Greg Fensky, they're, uh, they're, they're basically the key people when it comes to the financial dimensions of, of uh, basically what followed after his arrest. And so um, this comes out through the uh, bail hearings. It's a mixed bag of where this information comes from. It's the bail hearings. It's the uh, nine different NIGARD companies going into receivership. Some of them going, uh, I mean, the NIGARD International uh, filing for bankruptcy and, and then uh, U.S. authorities going after him. So you put this information together and, and, and it turns out that, um, or this is what the U.S. authorities are saying, it looks like um, the uh, NIGARD entities, companies connected to NIGARD's wealth, have been uh, cashing out assets, basically selling property in California worth about 70 million US dollars. And these are business entities that um, are under umbrella called NIGARD Properties Limited, United States of America. Uh, and, and, and then you have a couple of companies called Edsons and Browse. And these companies have been used uh, in order to get this money out of these properties, basically selling them. Um, and if you look at the, the paperwork of these companies, uh, you have Dina Tulikorpi, Greg Fensky, Angela Dyborn, those people mentioned in this civil suit I just talked about, um, and, and some other names, and they keep rotating in these papers. You, you have every two months a new filing, a new set of names, new names coming in, old names coming going out, but there's always Dina Tulikorpi's name is there, and... Um, and uh, uh, Angela Dyborn and Greg Fensky. And an interesting thing is that this Nygaard properties, uh, because I, I would assume it's not a great name for a company anymore, uh, the company's name was changed last August, August of 2020, and it was turned into a Hilka properties. And from American perspective, it may sound like, ah, okay, that has nothing to do with Peter Nygaard. Well, it has everything to do with Nygaard because Hilka was Nygaard's mom. I mean, his boat was called Lady Hilka. And so this company was uh, basically, if I understand correctly, is same as Nygaard Properties formerly was. And so um, something is going on in these companies. The U.S. authorities think they managed to take dozens of millions of dollars out of these things. Tina Tulikorp is involved in these companies. And we don't exactly know because Nygaard's name is not directly attached to these companies, but it did come in, in, in one section of the bail hearings, uh, turn out this curious fact that one company that Nygaard had nothing to do with had paid a 1 million commission for a property sale for Mr. Nygaard. I mean, it's just bizarre, to be honest. Well, it, 
as much as we know about this case, Pekka, it's clear that we're a long way from getting to the bottom of it and, and a lot more investigating has to be done. Lisa, what do you hope to achieve uh, from the plaintiffs, the victims in this case, from the civil side? Well, I know that in terms of the victims, we certainly hope they can receive a recovery. There's obviously no price you can put on rape and human trafficking. There's no amount of money that can ever make a victim completely whole from the trauma that they're going to live with for the rest of their lives. But it certainly speaks volumes to say that money and power enabled this to happen. And it should be taken away from those that would use it to abuse and exploit others and given to the people that were rightfully, that were harmed and rightfully deserved to be compensated in some way for what happened to them. So we hope to achieve that. We hope to be able to give back some measure of financial accountability to the victims in this case. Are we even close to getting to the bottom of this, Lisa? This case in general, well, I mean, the, the criminal liability, the, the number of victims, the financial liability, the civil side. That, that's kind of a loaded question. There are so many layers right now that are that are up in the air. And there's it's one of those situations where the answer to one question will lead to the next question. So the short answer is no, we're not. But we certainly have a roadmap and we are diligently working down that to be able to do everything we can for our clients. Pekka, how much more do you think there is to come out of this in Finland? Um, I've been very surprised that, uh, as far as I can tell, there's only uh, what I know. There is only one Finnish woman uh, who is accusing him of rape. Uh, she was a woman who uh, uh, went to a nightclub at the age of 17 in Helsinki, and he was here on a business trip, and then, uh, according to her, he raped her in, in his hotel room. Uh, so I was surprised that there aren't more Finnish women uh, who have come forward. Um, I don't know if there are more of them. I know that in the very early stages of, of, of uh, the, the civil case, uh, there were no Canadian women. And now I guess there are more than 20 of them. So you, you feel like, I, I keep hearing this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Some people say there are thousands of victims. I don't know about that. I I just I just know <laughs> you know what what others are saying, and and up until now it's hundred twenty and more. Um, I I've interviewed some people who were not raped by him, but who've been hugely uh, traumatized by Peter Nygaard's actions. Like um, there's a Finnish uh, famous violinist uh, Linda Lampenius, who he basically destroyed through uh, legal attacks, uh, sued her for defamation, asking for $40 million for damages because she had said something negative about him in a, in a newspaper article. Uh, he went after her and destroyed her life for 10 years, just like that, for, the, for almost like for the fun of it. And she essentially had to make a public statement uh, yeah. to out from under this, right? Uh, uh, applauding yeah, right. Him for his 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 civic minded affairs, right? Yes, I mean, correct. So she ended up. She was right in the beginning. All she did was make a comment. Yet he, Peter Nygaard, punished her in a way that she had no way to get out of except to capitulate. Is that pretty much it? Yeah, and and this is what. A lot of Finns don't understand about the American legal system is that a billionaire or mil uh, someone with dozens of millions of dollars can basically destroy somebody for for no real reason. And this is roughly what happened there. She managed her lawyers in America managed to convince Nygaard's lawyers that enough is enough. And so what she had to do is she had to pay a full page ad in a Finnish newspaper to apologize for the great suffering that Peter Nygaard had to go through. Um, and and uh, interestingly, in this ad, uh, Tina Tolikorpi was quoted, uh, accepting the uh, apology from Peter Nygaard on his behalf. And so uh, this, this, this made me feel like, oh my goodness, it's, it's what money can buy is a destruction of other human beings. And this have you talked to her? Yeah. Have you talked to her since the criminal charges? Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah. And what does she say now? Well, she's still hurting. 
as a result of her own experience but uh, i i can understand she's she's very happy to see that uh, uh nygaard is behind bars this is what she's told me um and um, i think a lot of other people who suffered one way or the other have reached out to her to to share their stories and and remember and and not everybody uh was raped not everybody was human trafficked there was a finnish woman who went to work for nygaard who wanted to work in his fashion boutique in beverly hills to have a fun experience in america and then she gets into marina del rey compound he asked her to read newspaper articles in finnish to him which is the most bizarre thing in the world and those articles by the way are about peter nygaard so she's reading them and then he snaps the electric locks on this is like early 90s and she panics and somehow manages manages to get out of the situation without uh being assaulted so you have people like this who are traumatized by experiences that were not rape or or something even But more they were victimized nevertheless yes exactly did uh, tina tula corby ever speak with you uh no she told me that because of all the legal processes that's the exact word she used uh she cannot give interviews to me she gave a statement uh where she said she's disgusted by the allegations uh she said because she was very close to nygaard's former late mom and and sister that they would be appalled if they were living so she was distancing herself from him and then she was denying all the allegations that uh had been made to me because i i basically i wrote a huge article about her and i sent her all the key points in my article and you, you know uh, offered her an opportunity to comment on them and then she just said you know i deny everything basically Pekka my canon we will link to your articles here on this um youtube show so people can check them out thank you very much for joining us from finland tonight staying up late and being on the show we will stay in touch and we will continue our reporting have a pleasant peaceful evening uh lisa final thoughts here if there are other victims out there other people who believe they have been victimized or traumatized by peter nygaard what should they do well before before i give you my contact information i want to first say that If something happened to somebody at the hands of Peter Nygaard, there's a lot of misunderstandings in terms of what legally is considered human trafficking, what legally is considered rape versus what our common beliefs are. So if something happened, I would ask that if you're willing to come forward, if you're willing to talk to us, please call our, our law firm. It's 844-HABA-LAW, that's 844-422-2529. You can call us, talk to us about what occurred and we'll see if you, have information that could be useful to the lawsuit or if you in fact want to become a plaintiff yourself and wanted to see if your claims are something that could be considered we'd be happy to talk to you about the possibility of that as well lisa haba thank you so much pekka my canon thank you so much for being with me tonight i appreciate it we will continue our reporting on the peter nygaard story if you want to see more on all of this you can watch unseemly the peter nygaard investigation on discovery plus it's streaming out right now. Thank you for joining me on another edition of Have a Seat with Chris Hansen. We'll be back very soon. Uh, we're working on a number of stories, a number of exciting things in the works, and um, I look forward to sharing those with you. Have a pleasant, peaceful evening. Remember, I'll be watching. Take care.